crypto people sometimes say, yeah, but Coinbase doesn't give you custodial rights to the thing because of your private wallet keys, blah, blah, blah. I get that. I get that mm -hmm. so much because that's the reason why crypto existed. It's one of the fundamental properties of it. But there's a lot of people, an overwhelming majority of the people that say, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Twenty twenty one will be remembered for many things in the world of finance, but perhaps top of the list will be the movement that many believe embodies the decentralization of finance, the rise of the retail investor. There's already a film in the works to tell the story of GameStop and how Reddit readers took on the hedge funds of Wall Street and won, but why not hear it from the Redditor himself? Here's me talking to Wall Street Bets founder, Jamie Rogozinski. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. So I wanted to ask you particularly about the retail uh, investor movement. Was, um, was this something that was already going kind of when Wall Street Bets became the sort of voice, so to speak, of the retail investor and this continued to go? Or was this something that sort of Wall Street Bets itself just kicked off? So I think there's a lot of components that come together at the right place. I don't know that there was something like this that existed prior. I know that my own motivations were in part shaped or molded by the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, I was working for a, a financial services company that went uh, out of business in that, in that moment. And so I myself was left out of a job for, uh, for some time. And eventually I ended up getting another job and doing well with that. And, and around that time, this is in 2012, when I create Wall Street Bets. And I create Wall Street Bets in part because I was definitely still feeling the burn from the financial crisis. And I'm looking, and, but now I have a job that's paying me really well and I'm single and I have no dependents and so I can embrace risk. Uh, and, and in part, and, and so I was hoping to try and grow my, my wealth, right? But, but in part, there's this bit of a, a animosity, I guess is the word I might be able to use, that, I, th that was lingering from 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And that's why calling it Wall Street Bets, it's like, all right, let's embrace this casino. Let's actually go out there, mm. see if we can make money, see if we can have fun. They seem to be making money, meaning the big banks, and they seem to be having fun with that, so, so why not? And, and after that, there's this organic growth Right, right off the bat, without really having to push it much, a lot of people started kind of coming in and celebrating. And, you know, it wasn't this, hey, this is how we're going to occupy Wall Street now. Right. right. It was more, let's try and make some money, let's have fun. And it also struck me as like um, a sort of informational thing as well, because previously, you know, I was a portfolio manager myself, and typically people would pay a portfolio manager to do the investing for them. But do you think Wall Street Bets sort of came along at the right time? Because you know, there was a huge amount of access to, you know, A, something like a Robin Hood account where you could trade yourself, but also being able to, you know, research these companies yourself. I mean, it was, was it just like all these things happening at the, at the right time? And there's one more component to that too. The answer is yes, <laughs> you have the ease of access to the market through at first discount brokers, then eventually free, I mean, meaning commission, mm -hmm. no minimum, instant funding, the interfaces which are really user friendly. Uh, that, that allow you to have access to information, that allow you to trade these complex derivatives very, relatively easily. Uh, and the other component is the stock's been going up for, well, <laughs> since the 2008 crisis yeah. in a straight line for the most part. And that, I think, is an additional component which yeah. makes it really easy to make money. I'm gonna slightly shoot myself in the foot now because when I was learning to be a portfolio manager, I went through almost years of training about fundamental analysis and how to look at balance sheets and accounting. Um, and for lack of a, another expression, like meme stock trading has now become a genuine sort of way to make money. And I think people, certainly of a more traditional uh, generation, I think, you know, they don't, they don't think it's a real way of investing. So I'm interested in your view on that because, you know, if you look at technical traders, you could say, well, here's an upside down bar and candle chart and that makes money. So ultimately, the way to make money is to think about the psychology of a market. And if trading meme stocks is a way of predicting future psychology, then doesn't it have the same sort of place at the table? So I'm interested in your thoughts on those things. Yeah, you're cutting short the technical analysis component, but that is a you know the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. if that's where you were going towards. The, you know, and, and there's also high-frequency traders, right? Like they, they, the, the computers, they're not doing discount 
cash flow analysis. Right. They haven't right? got an Excel they're, spreadsheet up doing they're, uh, they're making Yeah, there's a, it's a formula, and they have their own inefficiencies to see that they're exploiting. And their time horizon is milliseconds as opposed to forever, which is what Warren Buffett does. And so yeah. calling something that's not real, what these meme stock traders are doing is not real, is really, well, it's just different. But they work, right? They can coexist, just like high-frequency computers that actually serve a productive component of the liquidity in the markets and all these things. Uh, just like short sellers, right? These people are kind of doing fundamental analysis, but they well used to be able to go on road shows and try to convince everyone to do the same. Like, yeah. there there's a lot of components that can coexist. So it's not the right way and the wrong way. It's the right way and the right way and the right way. Whatever fits your style and whatever you have fun. But yeah, meme, meme stock. Look, there's there's a bunch of examples. One that's the most recent one, right? So I'll start by one that that I like. Uh, slightly less recent, which was Zoom. When the pandemic hit and locked everyone at home and it was evident people have to use this video conferencing technology, people w went to Zoom and said, this thing's gonna go up. And so you have the fundamental analysts that sat their wag in their fingers saying, you guys are all jumping to conclusions because uh, just because you're gonna have more demand for a product does not make it a, a solid investment. Have you looked at the unit economics of this business? Are mm -hmm. they cash flow positive? Do they have, or are you gonna break them into the ground because of this surge in demand? All you know is that more people will use teleconferencing. That's not enough to make a thesis. Well, to put salt on the wound, everyone ran to their you know, Robinhood account and they typed in Zoom and they spelled it out and they found another company whose ticker symbol was the word Zoom spelled out. Right, I remember nothing, this. Nothing to do with the actual <laughs> teleconferencing company they were hoping for. And, and so the wrong Zoom ended up making more money yeah. than the correct Zoom, right? right. And, and so, so here's the fundamental analyst going, ha, 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 not only were you wrong with your thesis, you go out the wrong company, you fool. And these fools ended up making more money, and, and the name of the game is making money. So, yeah. who, you know, who's a fool? More recently, I was just looking this morning, there's a, um, uh, a, an ETF that's launched by Ryan Hell Investments from a guy that I know. Uh, under the name Meta, M-E-T-A. Mm -hmm. And as we've come to learn recently, Facebook's new name is going to be just that. So this guy hit the jackpot. Uh, if you look at the chart, right, you know, the, the stock went through the roof. And you can say, well, it's going through the roof because Facebook is saying they're going to go into this metaverse and the CTF is focused on metaverse stuff. So, uh, so it's, it's not just the name, it's a wise investment. But if you look at the volume on that chart, it's night and day different. I mean, just multiples, orders of magnitude, more, more interest than that. Uh, and this person's strategy, if you look at some of the ETFs he launches, he always goes for these, I think he owns the word, the, the, stock, the meme stock ETF, and it's M-E-M-E, -E. -M -E. that's the same guy. So he gets the name of the game over here, which is, hey, right. what's in a name? This is like the dot-com version <laughs> of, of picking ticker symbols, which is an effective way of, of investing. And if it makes money, then are you allowed to say that it doesn't count? Or is it just because it makes money in a different way and it's just uncomfortable that it doesn't fit into your Excel sheet? I mean, I guess the proof's in the pudding. I mean, if it makes money, it works. So, I, so that actually brings me on to people who uh, are investing in, in, in memes or looking at what's going to be the next meme stop. I was thinking about whether there's like a checklist. Because when I think about GameStop, I mean, it was a cheap stock, and I think that's something that people liked about it, and there was a bit of a story. Um, and so when people look now, who are thinking, what's going to be the next meme stock? It doesn't necessarily have to be cheap. I mean, you mentioned Zoom. Um, is there a kind of checklist, or what, is it easy to predict or hard to predict? It's, it's funny. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get into the checklist, but I'll address first the, this component of cheap stock. You know, that, that probably one of the components, and I've joked about this in the past, that, you know, the idea is buy low and sell high. Yeah. That's how you make money, and that's what people say. <clears throat> and oftentimes people take that advice really literally to the extreme. So there's two examples. When um, also in the pandemic, when, when Hertz went out and declared bankruptcy, you know, their stock was trading at like $2 a share. And so that number is pretty darn close to zero. If, the, if the, the idea is to buy low and sell high, then how much closer to low can you get, right? Don't yeah. mind the fact that they just said they're going to go bust. It's this is a cheap, you know, this is a cheap shot. And sure enough, they've shot that price well over 100%. And, yeah. you know, to the point where Hertz then went to a judge and said, hey, these maniacs are trading our stocks. Can we sell some more and then get out of debt? Uh, and, then, and then more recently, you had uh, Tesla. It was trading around $2,000 per share. 
And then they decided to do something we haven't seen in decades, which was a split, right? <laughs> something from the dot coms. And so it went down to like $400 a share. Uh, I don't remember exactly if it was four or five to one. But it made the stock, it made the price of the stock cheap, the price per share, right? It didn't change any fundamental anything. It just kind of reshuffled the money yeah. so that now this thing costs less money. And it's not, nothing to do with, well, now more people can afford it because you already have fractional shares. People can already mm -hmm. put in $100 into Tesla, right? And regardless mm -hmm. of how many, and the returns will be the same. In this particular case, it's, well, look how cheap this stock is. Yeah. And sure enough, now it's well on its way back up to 2000 Just all ticks. I wouldn't be surprised if they split again, just to just to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, but if it worked the first time, it'd be interesting to see if it works the second time. Yeah. Um, so looking a bit more into today, uh, I'm interested, Jamie, what you're um, getting most excited about. I know you're looking more um, intensely into digital assets and NFTs. So can you talk more about like what's getting you excited today? Yeah. So I'll start with the background of when Bitcoin first came out. I, you know, I have this economics background. I have a technology background. I love this concept. This is great. I set up a mining rig and I was making Bitcoins and I probably, you know, they're worth millions probably now. Uh, and I don't have that, but I don't really. I was going to say that you don't still have them. I would. I don't know where it is, but I, <laughs> you know, I don't really kick to shoot myself over because I wouldn't have held it this long anyways. So. Okay. Okay. So with Bitcoin, I kind of part ways. I don't reevaluate my stance into uh, digital assets or cryptocurrencies. I just see that they're popping up Ethereum and this and that. You're still a believer in the blockchain technology. I think it's cool. I yeah. think it's fun. I think it's a good idea, and, and, and I'm really hoping that it works throughout these years. But I don't go back and reevaluate to realize that there is like this whole other world that exists, this parallel ecosystem for finance and for for. Uh, well, and not only for financial transactions, for f finance, there's a lot of money that exists in there and there's a lot of opportunities. So I kick myself, not for not buying coins earlier, but for not realizing that this thing existed, this, yeah. this uh, ability to plug into the existing or create alternate financial mechanisms by which people can interact in insanely efficient manners. Mm -hmm. they, you know, one example, they figured out um, a different market structure called the automated market makers, which is a brilliant decentralized approach for basically swapping stuff from one thing to another thing, solving very complex problems, right? And this, the, the, the normal markets we're familiar with, like in the stocks, you have an order book, you have the limit orders on the uh, bid and ask, and then you have market orders that push these prices around. Uh, and you're usually only working with one additional asset. You have the dollars on one side and then you have, but with crypto, you can swap stuff right. for other stuff. Yeah. So it's really, really cool to watch an <clears throat> insane amount of creativity, really well thought out, lessons learned, improvements on the actual mechanism by which people can interact to exchange things that are, that are I mean, it's, it's something I've, I've been learning recently. It's like the world of finance has so many tiny fees that are associated with all kinds of transactions that blockchain technology is not only going to basically get rid of, but speed up. And I find it very difficult to like try and get my head around the pace at which these transactions can happen. So literally instantaneous payments, instantaneous transactions, and what that kind of means for us for like our social and daily lives that we don't have to wait for anything to clear anymore. Yeah, I mean, instant settlement is absolutely one of the biggest things that one of the biggest benefits that the, the DeFi space can give you. Instant settlement uh, reduces the systemic risk of the counterparty, etc. Uh, it, it creates a lot more efficiency. You have uh, also 24 hour day trading. That's another systemic risk. Turning off the market is a, it's a risky endeavor. If you have news that comes out on the weekend and all of a sudden prices you know, open up before your stop uh, or underneath your stop, you have to rebalance your entire portfolio. You know, I have live in Mexico and I have a bank there and I have a bank here in the US. Moving money across, I don't even try to do it anymore. Right. Although I also have a lot of crypto money, which I don't consider to be in one place or the other. It's just in the cloud, if you will. But with my US bank account, it is painfully difficult to use that money. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many nightmare stories I've had of trying to pay lawyers $25,000 and having to use Zelle in $2,500 increments because right. I keep hitting the daily limits and transaction limits. It's like, sorry, it's going to take me 10 days to give you your money because I, my bank doesn't do wire transfers, uh, at least not domestically. There's another case where right now we're, we're getting ready to throw this, this party in Miami. And we have sponsors and this thing is going to be an expensive party to throw. So some, we have a sponsor that gives me $100,000 in crypto 
right? So the, and the venue takes it in, in fiat. So let's convert this to crypto. So first comes to Mexico so that I can use because it was in Binance. And so I have to make the swap into Ethereum, which, which is easier to use in the US. I send to the US to my brother who then puts that into his bank account. He then tries to transfer the 100,000 and people's like, no, no, you can't do that. It's just, you're setting off too many uh, alarm bills. So, so you're gonna have to, you couldn't even write a physical check, right? Mm -hmm. And so the solution was literally to wire the money to our coordinator of this event who lives in Canada, right? Convert that into Canadian dollars and she then can wire the money back. So this thing goes from crypto <laughs> to Mexican Binance system to the US to whatever, just so that we can make a silly payment, right? Yeah. Like, and yeah. yes, it's a lot of money, but but the, the first, you know, the, the first part was the easiest, yeah. which was to get control of this money. And then for the venue to get it, it was a nightmare. And it wasn't just that conversion. It was just the banks that actually have all this, mm. you know, disaster. so if you're slowing down transactions, you're not helping the economy. Yeah. I mean, it seems ridiculous in 2021 that it takes that long to do, to do <laughs> one payment. But anyway, um, a lot of improvements uh, c can be made for sure. So, um, Jamie, let's talk a bit about uh, what you're working on now. Um, I know uh, from previous interviews, you've taken more of an interest in NFTs and uh, ETFs, I think, in the world of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so ETFs, I was interested because I, I, I'm very familiar with ETFs, the ones that are on... Uh, uh, the stock exchange and when I first started learning about these exotic derivatives whatever I bumped into 3x ETFs these leveraged ETFs that are both bear and bull right and I'm thinking to myself all right well uh, I'll, I'll stick this stick aside the, the the bear concept for another conversations but the leverage component has this side effect where there's decay on the price and it goes to zero over time uh, and then when I bumped into these leveraged ETFs on the blockchain, right, similar concept, you have an underlying and then you leveraged it with multiple factors. Mm. I noticed that there's not an actual answer for how many X's I'm getting on my leverage. Mm. And after, after uh, reading more about this, it turns out that they mitigated this volatility decay component, right, which basically it's a mathematical factor. Uh, you know, feature or flaw or whatever, that if there's a ranging market for this 3x ETF, that money just decays away. The, the, the smart contract version of this, which allows you to put more logic into it, says, well, if the underlying is ranging, then you can turn down the, uh, the leverage to almost as close to one as possible. And then when it breaks out of that range and it starts trending, then beef up the, uh, the leverage component and you get the, comp get the compounding effect. Right for your return. So they eliminated the fact that it goes to zero. They made it so that you make more money when the thing is on the move, right? That is a really brilliant approach to things. So that is one of a gazillion examples, additional examples that exist in, um, in the ETF version of it. I also am uh, working on a fun uh, ETF that works or an ETP that works on the blockchain that tr tracks Excuse me, Nancy Pelosi's portfolio, probably one of our <laughs> best investors of our modern era, and right. her husband. Uh, and we can do that through oracles, through smart contracts. We can try and balance things pretty much as quick as either she makes a disclosure or right. it's leaked. So literally uh, as quick as a tweet comes out or some information comes out, you can rebalance that. That's correct. Well, I haven't go to SEC and ask for permission to change the composition wow. of this thing. Right, it won't be one to one because there's delays, and sometimes these uh, disclosures don't give you the exact breakdown. But look, even if we can get close to her returns, we'll be really happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another great application of this. Uh, and then with NFTs, look, I got into NFT. I start watching these things go by, and they're dominating headlines. And and I decided not to make the same assumptive mistake that uh, I made with Bitcoin, which was. Well, this looks like that on the outside, so I made my evaluation. Mm. I said, no, if somebody just paid a million dollars for a rock, then I need to understand why instead right. of just saying that sounds silly. Right. So I go in, <clears throat> dive deep into this thing, and I really see that there's some serious staying power, right? There's, there's certainly the tulip mania component. There's a lot of excitement and a lot of money that, that exists and infinite number of projects that pop up every day. Uh, and that's almost uh, reminiscent of the 2018 ICO craze where people mm -hmm. literally chasing these pump and dumps and, they're, and they know the name of the game and they're doing it because right. it's fun and they have the opportunity to try to make money. But there's, a, there's another component which will outlast this short-term trend, which is now you have, yes, an asset class, 
artwork, whatever, mm -hmm. right? But you also have these kind of tickets into these communities, mm. right? So I just created, for example, an NFT for uh, the WSB DAP community. And this is like a Diamond Hands NFT and people can purchase this uh, for 0 0.1 Ethereum. And, and, and it's meant to enhance the access of the experience of the community, get better rewards, they get airdrops, they get all sorts of things mm -hmm. in crypto like. But in the real world, that party I was just referencing is just for NFT holders. What about the actual mechanics of it? Like how easy is it to just go out there and buy these NFTs? I mean, I think there's a lot of people that still don't understand the world. One of the biggest opportunities in crypto is going to be when somebody makes what they're calling Web 3.0 look like Web 2.0, right? Mm -hmm. Web 2.0 is social media as we know it. It's really seamless. You know, grandparents can use it. Web 3.0 is now kind of this blockchain integrated yeah. DeFi space, which is a lot more complicated, a lot more complicated. My dad called me the other day and he's, you know, to explain 70s. It. He said, how do I buy crypto? I want to buy the Dogecoin. All right, and he's like the most risk averse version. I'm like, oh man, we're in that phase of the cycle now. <laughs> uh, but then he asked me about my coin, you know, the Wall Street Bets one, and, and I said, I, you can't, sorry, Dad. You have to download MetaMask and configure the thing with the protocol and the BSC and then swap the money and then do all the pancake swapping. You do these weird words. Right. With, so that's, right now, the crypto market is only g getting the attraction of crypto enthusiasts or diehards of people that can actually go through with it. Yeah. Uh, an NFT for a crypto person is seamless. It's like going to eBay. You just buy it with you Ethereum go in, or Bitcoin. You buy it, you have your setup, but you already need to have a lot of stuff in there. You know, Ethereum or Bitcoin is the easy one. You go outside of those, you go to Solana, whatever, and now you have a difficult time. But Coinbase is about to come in there, right? I, I signed up for the Coinbase wait list. And I was number 2.4 million on the list, <laughs> right? That's a lot of people. That is. OpenSea has 200,000 active accounts. 2.4 million people on Coinbase, if they just push a buy button and you just type in your credit card, my dad can now buy an NFT, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, something that he can't currently do because I would have to give him phone When support. that happens, you've just got, that's a huge amount of retail money I'm that coming so into so excited. And then people sometimes, the crypto people sometimes say, yeah, but Coinbase doesn't give you custodial rights to the thing because of your private wallet keys, blah, blah, blah. I get that. I get that mm. so much because that's the reason why crypto existed. It's one of the fundamental properties of it. But there's a lot of people, an overwhelming majority of the people that say, I don't care. When you buy your stocks on Robinhood, you're not owning those stocks either. Robinhood's holding them for you, right? right. And they're just kind of telling yeah. you this is your account. There's no different from that. And yes, mm -hmm. we know that Mountain Gox happened who knows how long ago, and I get that. I sympathize towards that, but there, the opportunity for the crypto world being more accessible mm -hmm. to the average person is infinitely higher than the potential risks, which people are already accepting anyways when they deposit money in their bank, mm -hmm. right? If it's over $250,000 for the yeah. FDIC insurance, or if they do whatever it is, that they're already doing that risk and they're cool with it. So let's, so let's embrace that as a gateway drug. Then people can download MetaMask. Then they can do all these configurations right. and learn how to use PancakeSwap. Yeah. So Jamie, kind of a crystal ball question for you. Um, as we look out over the next two or three years, what do you think are gonna be you know, some of the biggest issues we're talking about. Do you see the same trends we've got going now just continuing? The velocity of change is increasing at such an exponential rate mm -hmm. that a half an hour away from Twitter is enough to be out of touch. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know if that's um, depressing or not. Years into the future is way too far to predict, but there's some slower moving tendencies that are changing, which is this generational shift of, of valuation uh, of how we're measuring things that we care about. Uh, a dollar or an ounce of gold may not be worth, and I'm not talking about discounted cash flow analysis or present values, the, the actual value with which people think, I want to store my money in this particular thing is different than that particular thing, or I don't want to store my money in general, is changing, mm -hmm. right? There are people that are, have uh, a new set of preferences where ownership of homes is less relevant, where ownership of vehicles is less relevant. If these are the people that are inheriting the world that they're saying, yeah, there's a lot of light bulbs that I have to change if I buy this place, mm -hmm. or if not, my landlord has. Obviously, someone has to own that house to rent anyways, but there's a preference towards mm. the shift in valuation, which is like, I don't need to own that to to feel better about myself or to make a smart investment decision. There's enough of those investment decisions as it is. What, I did this this uh, Twitter spaces with a guy who told me, I have an NFT collection that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And, 
and I live, I've been living in a hotel in Hong Kong for 18 months. And he goes, it's the greatest thing in the world. They make my bed, they bring me rooms. It's much more expensive mm -hmm. than living in a house. Not, not the most financially sound decision. But it doesn't feel the liability and the burden. Then. It's a lifestyle. It's yeah. like, this is how I choose to live my time on earth. Mm. I have enough money that I can buy 10 houses if I wanted to, mm. but it just feels better <laughs> to live this way. And so we have to know that this is, this is a large group of people that are taking over. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that that's going to really shape things years down the line when these, this generation does effectively change uh, the, the, the way that they approach value and ownership and the way they live their lives. Jamie, I've had such a great time chatting with you today. I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you very much. I thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you. Trying to predict markets is nothing short of Sisyphean. It's as futile as trying to predict the future, but luckily, that's not the goal of an investor. The goal of investing is to make the best asset selection based on the available information and the risk reward profile you are presented with and do that consistently. We don't know what the future holds, but by keeping up with what the experts are saying about the future of investing, well, that does give you edge. If you'd like to read more on the topic, please go to footsierussell.com forward slash research for more information.